so Michael has uh, been working um, as a, a member of the Friends of Sligo Creek. Um, he's past president of that organization and currently serves as their chair of natural history. And he's been working with them and um, with Pepco on a meadow in Chillum, Maryland. And they've been working on that since I think 2007 to try to change the mowing regime there. And the results have been nothing less than spectacular and hugely encouraging. Uh, and in addition to that one site that he has uh, returned to a healthy biosphere, um, he's working with the Sierra Club to try to help change the laws. I don't know all the details of the public spaces exactly and how far they have to be from roads, but all these weed ordinances that we have to keep our, we have to mow anything, herbaceous things have to be mowed to 12 inches or less. And so he's working on laws to change that. I'm sure that um, we all understand the importance of that. So with no further ado, let's uh, let's go to Michael's lovely slides. Yeah, as as mentioned, uh, uh, I joined Friends of Sligo Creek in 2005. And uh, very quickly, I was asked to uh, be the chair of the Natural History Committee. I didn't feel the least bit qualified at the time, but they said, oh, it doesn't matter. We have plenty of people in Friends of Sligo Creek who, who will provide all the expertise. And I said, okay, that sounds good. So I, I did it and uh, started organizing outings. And one of the first outings I organized was uh, with John Parrish on winter woody plant, woody plant IDs. He's a, a prominent uh, field botanist in the Mid-Atlantic, has worked with uh, the National Park Service and uh, on contract with uh, US Geological Survey. And uh, I'll get to him uh, a little bit later. But uh, so here's uh, just two scenes from the meadow. Uh, uh, blue toad flax in the foreground on the left and a black swallowtail uh, with um, New York ironweed uh, on the right. And what, what this is leading to is a, a bill that I'll describe, which you've heard uh, reference to, that will remove a significant barrier to more uh, utilities in more locations, uh, being able to reduce their mowing and uh, generate uh, uh, habitats just like this. So uh, I'll go through these topics, the, uh, how important uh, power lines can be as habitats, uh, the successes we've had uh, where, where Pepco's power line crosses uh, Sligo Creek, a uh, few other examples of power line meadows, the few we have in Maryland, uh, the ex extent that's, uh, of power lines that are untapped in this way, and the weed ordinances uh, exemptions and how the new law would work. And that's uh, orange milkweed in the Sligo Meadow in 2009. So uh, I was I first encountered this uh, not long after uh, John Parrish on an outing uh, mentioned if we could just get the pe the Pepco to mow less on our power line, uh, we could have a spectacular meadow. And I uh, shortly thereafter uh, this book was issued, the National Audubon Society Field Guide to New England, 2008. And among the habitat, if you know these guides, they're really excellent. Uh, they're not exhaustive, of course, uh, but they're handy. And uh, they start off with uh, all the different kinds of habitats in whatever region the book covers. And I'm flipping through it in the, in the plane, heading to Maine to see my sister. And I see, uh, including, you know, alpine and, and uh, riparian and coastal habitats. There it is, uh, 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 open spaces, including power lines. And this line was, is in the book, power line corridors are becoming one of the region's most important open spaces. Many scrub loving birds find the habitat suits them providing excellent cover and food resources. And I thought, well, that's amazing that Audubon uh, would think uh, to mention it. So that's gave me a little more motivation to keep going. Uh, you might know David Wagner from this uh, fantastic field guide to caterpillars of Eastern North America. Through the University of Connecticut, he's also done some research, uh, perhaps it was a contract uh, on uh, uh, power lines as uh, as habitat, uh, and that's those studies were done in upstate New York. And one of his conclusions was uh, was this transmission line corridors provide important early successional habitat for a ta taxonomically rich array of native plant and animal life, including populations of rare species, and thus play an important role in biodiversity conservation. So that's another motivating uh, endorsement. Uh, Surprisingly, well, not surprisingly, the power, the power utility companies in their attitude and approach toward using their power lines as, as, as a habitat are, are all over the map. 
but there's one industry group in Chicago out of the University of Illinois, uh, Chicago campus, uh, uh, Utility Arbors Association. They have a very uh, uh, enlightened environmental stewardship unit that has been very helpful. And uh, here uh, it is where they say they recognize that the excellence in, uh, uh, let's see, UVM, oh, uh, uh, utility vegetation management can only be achieved when we treat our rights of way as, as ecosystems. So as I mentioned, uh, John Parrish uh, led a talk back, at, uh, an outing back in 2006, probably it was a rainy day in January. And we got to the end of the Sligo Creek paved trail where it em emerges into this open area that's, uh, and this is pretty much what it would have looked like if the sun had been shining that day. Mown right to a nub six times a year. And uh, when John mentioned this, you know, I thought I'm not a specialist in, in, a, in plants and the insects, any of those things, but you know, maybe I can do something at a landscape level and also working with Pepco and I'm willing to put in the time. It turned out that Friends of Sligo Creek had tried for the previous three years to get Pepco to stop mowing so often. And the vegetation manager at the time refused citing the weed ordinance and uh, his uh, fear that the neighbors would be upset and, and complain. So uh, based on that, we developed uh, a, a flyer and we, we uh, uh, left flyers at all the homes along both sides of the power line explaining what we were gonna do uh, and, uh, and the reasons for it. Now, I, I, I forgot to mention that in 2007, a new uh, power, a vegetation manager, for Pepco came on board and we met with him, same pitch, same reasons, same situation. He said, okay, sure, I'll do it. So it's, uh, uh, so he did. And uh, here's the uh, meadow, it's only a quarter mile long. It's between Riggs Road and East West Highway in Chillum, sometimes called, uh, sometimes people consider this Hyattsville. Uh, and uh, it basically extends from the creek up to this ridge here. This is the high point. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, as you might've noticed in that previous uh, slide, you can see the rolling terrain here. This only gives a hint of how hilly it really, well, you can see how steep this hill is. Uh, this is right on the fall line or the fall zone where the coastal plain bumps up against the Piedmont. And those are typically uh, full of steep hills and ravines and gullies and so forth. And that's really been a huge advantage uh, in this little project. So that in this very short space, uh, there's a pretty good change of elevation. By the time you get down to Riggs Road here, or really East West Highway, uh, uh, it, it, it's completely flat. I'm sorry, here it's, if you follow the creek, uh, by the time it gets right about here, uh, it's the end of the, of the fall line and it's completely flat. And those are the sandy soils of the coastal plain. So here's just a, a, one of the many propaganda photos I took uh, usually with uh, Pepco in mind to try to give them materials that they can, the people in the environmental stewardship division uh, to give them uh, material they can use to, uh, to promote the value of doing this to the higher ups at Pepco uh, because the environmental stewardship division is often at odds with the vegetation management division and vegetation management always gets the last word. Uh, so sometimes things get mowed when you least expect it. Now we, uh, this entire project is a, an example of passive restoration. There was no, uh, nothing was planted. In fact, there was no herbiciding. Uh, it entirely depended on stopping mowing and seeing what's in the seed bank, what, uh, new seeds are brought in by the wind or by animals. And uh, so this is uh, balsam ragwort, which I'm pretty virtually certain that's what it is. And uh, hemp dogbane, which we'll uh, get to later. Um, we, uh, we did our first plant survey there in 2013, and we came up with about 60 native plants, an equal number of non-natives, most of which were naturalized, the uh, European uh, uh, plants that had come in in the colonial era. Uh, we also did a, uh, uh, we had an ecologist, Rhonda Krantz, who uh, did two bee surveys 
working with uh, Sam Drogi at the U.S. Geological Survey, and uh, and documented 97 species of native bees, which is uh, uh, a, almost a fourth of all the bees in the entire state of Maryland uh, have been supported by this little quarter mile stretch. And uh, we have a, an excellent birder now who lives in the neighborhood and is active on eBird. And if you follow eBird hotspots, he created a hotspot for this meadow. And we now have 84 species of birds, not necessarily breeding, but uh, observed using uh, the meadow. So this is bearded beggar ticks on the top and American germander on the right. That's a mint family. And the bearded beggar ticks, uh, I think uh, uh, it's kind of sunflower in, the, in Biden's genus. Uh, so in addition to profusion of, of great plants that are fairly abundant and, 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 and not hard to find, some uh, rare plants have been spotted. This Southern slender lady stresses was found by Katja Schultz who is an entomologist at Smithsonian and frequently uh, comes to the meadow uh, and has documented untold number of uh, flies, that's her specialty, as well as uh, bees and uh, butterflies, caterpillars and so forth. Maryland golden aster, this, the, the, there's a, uh, this site is the only one in all the Sligo watershed, which is eight miles long, the only site in Sligo that, that supports um, Maryland golden aster and swamp aster, which was documented in the um, meadow in uh, 2002 when John Parrish did his original native plant survey of the watershed. And it's uh, still there. It's at the bottom of a gully. It's a true wetland. Uh, I've dug up the soil there. It's very silvery, uh, gray, slick soil. I sent pictures to the Anacostia Watershed Society. And that's our only true historic water uh, uh, wetland. But that comes up reliably every, every summer. In the fall, it's quite gorgeous. Uh, all of the uh, American asters, uh, bone set goldenrods, uh, the uh, shining sumac, sometimes called uh, winged sumac, uh, starts turning the beautiful red of the, uh, of the leaves, and it's 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 quite a delight in the in the fall. So there, uh, I know this isn't a uh, uh, a bird group, but you you know it's all one big system. Uh, the uh, the number of birds. Uh, if you if you look in the uh, breeding bird atlas for Maryland and, and, and DC, uh, the second edition, he has a nice uh, uh, section on uh, on habitats, and one of them is shrubby meadows, uh, and it, he outlines the the kind of birds that are dependent on shrubby meadows to, for nesting meadows, and three of them uh, are uh, uh, nest in in our little quarter mile meadow, uh, brown thrasher, uh, indigo bunting, and uh, blue grosbeak. Uh, more importantly, for serving, you know, uh, wildlife of Maryland, but also for political reasons, you know, you always want to find an endangered plant on your, if you're trying to save a property. But here we have three birds that are in decline statewide uh, that we, that do nest in, uh, no, that are, that utilize the meadow. Uh, the American kestrel it has been uh, nesting there every year for the last uh, 10 years. Field sparrow and uh, eastern towhee. Eastern towhee you hear a lot, uh, but if you look at the charts uh, statewide, it is in decline. Now here's the American kestrel. I focus on the kestrel because uh, in our uh, site visits with Jorge Montero, Bogantes Montero uh, from Anacostia Watershed Society, when we told him we were getting kestrels, he said we should uh, shift our emphasis or our mindset to from managing for pollinators uh, to managing for kestrels because their habitat is even rarer than uh, wildflower meadows uh, or grasslands. So for the purposes of the bill that we're bringing to the uh, legislature, we're using pollinators because it's just so much more widely known that they are an issue. But the kestrel, if you take a look at the, these breeding bird survey results from 1966 to 2000, 2006, and, you know, and those huge percentages of drops. Uh, and in uh, uh, Walter Ellison, in the second edition of the Breeding Bird Atlas, says the maintenance of open land with sufficient prey is necessary to preserve this little falcon. 
in Maryland. So we're, we're doing that. And here's what we provide uh, the kestrels. Uh, uh, they love grasshoppers. And I found this fabulous quote from a little book called Birds of a Maryland Farm, 1902. And he puts it only as someone could have put it writing back then. Grasshoppers, when abundant, are to the bird what bread is to man. Uh, we have six species of grasshoppers, at least. Uh, and uh, their favorite food, although they eat lots of plants, uh, are uh, grasses. We have 15 species of native grasses. Uh, one of the more unusual is this eastern gamma grass, Tripsacum dactyloides at the right. It's extremely tall. Uh, and uh, it's not very common in the uh, Maryland uh, suburbs. And that's, uh, the. I should have mentioned that all the photos you see are taken in the Sligo Meadow. This one on the upper right here was not taken in the Sligo Meadow. It's hard finding uh, birds with prey. So here's uh, two photos of the kestrel in our meadow. This uh, is where the kestrel likes to perch. It's at the very, very top. So it must be 300 feet up uh, uh, in the uh, towers themselves. And that's actually where they build their nests in the hollow chambers inside these uh, power line towers. Uh, one of our members got to watch them mating uh, uh, and trees alongside the border that's in the center. And uh, the photo on the right, as you see, is from Blackwater, but it shows you uh, the kind of habitat they love to, to hunt in. Uh, the, the meadow is, is also very friendly to foxes. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a fox family on a very steep embankment on the uh, southwest side of Sligo, of the creek itself. And, uh, uh, and they, they eat, as you know, you know, they have a wide, wide ranging uh, 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 diet, but they do like uh, blackberries and the, the border, the edge of the meadow is packed with uh, Pennsylvania blackberry, Rubus pennsylvanicus. Now for uh, selling the, uh, the idea of less mowing, uh, pollinators is, is our ticket to uh, getting the attention of, uh, of legislators and the general public. Like I said, we uh, had two surveys in 2013, 2014, native, 27 native bee species uh, identified by Sam Drogi's lab in, uh, in, uh, at Patuxent. Um, uh, I, and uh, I, I, I don't have these identified by photographer, but for certainly Katja Schultz could have taken all three. Also, uh, Adrian Vandenbeep, who's on this call, has taken quite a few photos of our insects. Uh, and uh, I took the one of the uh, uh, mining, mining, bill, mining bee uh, nest in the ground. They love bare ground. In fact, I know there's a lot of gardeners here. And if you look at the Xerxes guide to supporting uh, native pollinators, they actually try to <laughs> convince you that a bare patch in your yard is a good thing. Uh, it, that'd be a hard sell for most gardeners. Uh, butterflies and moths uh, are probably what, or at least butterflies are what most people think of as pollinators, even though they play a fairly minor role in that respect. Uh, common buckeye is abundant in the, in the meadow, but it's, even though it's called common in its common name, in fact, it's uncommon in Sligo. We have a very authoritative uh, a checklist of butterflies in Sligo uh, done by two entomologists who, who live in the, in the watershed uh, and they're specialists in, uh, in butterflies. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the buckeye uh, uh, caterpillar feeds on uh, blue toad flax, which we have, uh, bracted plantain, which we have, and other plantains, including uh, introduced uh, naturalized species. We have a, uh, the, the meadow, like I said, with the, uh, the steep and undulating uh, landscape, but some of the higher points in the meadow, we, we have seeps and wet areas. In fact, where that um, tripsacum uh, gamma grass is growing is a, little, is a very strange wet one. Uh, and uh, Phragmites grows up there also. Uh, and even though it's quite high, and a pair of uh, mallard ducks uh, nested there a couple summers ago. They thought it was a wet <laughs> as soon as they saw them. Who knows, maybe they saw the gamma grass or they saw the Phragmites. So even a little further uphill from there uh, is a wet one probably caused by a parking lot built uh, on the other side of the uh, bordering of the meadow. Uh, but there's so many seeps in this, 
in this uh, landscape. So this, this meadow near the top supports um, fox sedge, and uh, I can't tell you what caterpillars it has attracted, but it's capable of hosting 30 species of, of caterpillars. And we, needless to say, uh, we have lots and lots of goldenrods, and uh, it, goldenrods in general so can support upwards of 100 species of moths and butterflies. Now, here's a really interesting story uh, that I think is fairly recent research uh, that I stumbled across. Uh, you probably know that dogbane is related to milkweed. In fact, the, the family it used to be called the milkweed family. Now it's called the dogbane family, I guess, because the dogbane is considered to be a more ancestral uh, branch of the entire lineage. It's uh, no, uh, 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 someone else can chime in as the family name, but it's taken from the genus uh, Aposinum. So everyone knows that, or most people know that, uh, that the uh, monarch caterpillar uh, is unusual in that it can, uh, 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 it can digest or tolerate the uh, toxic milky sap of the milkweed, which gives the plant its name. The toxicity of the milky sap is retained and not uh, converted into some uh, 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 neutral compound through the digestive system. So the monarch caterpillars, and I think the adults also, yeah, the adults also, or maybe it's only the adults, but let's just say it's both, are toxic to birds. And once a bird eats one, monarch, caterpillar, adult, it vomits it out and it won't need another one. Uh, and the, the, the adult communicates this to uh, birds by its unique uh, wing pattern. It's a reliable uh, signal to the birds that it's not appealing. Well, it turns out that there is a moth that specializes in dogbane. It's called the delicate uh, cycnia moth that used to be called the dogbane tiger. This moth, the caterpillar, can also tolerate the toxic milky sap of the dog bait. Well, of course, uh, the moths fly at night. They're not preyed upon by birds. They're preyed upon by bats. And it's dark, so it wouldn't do any good to have a monarch-like color pattern of the wings. So what does it do instead? It makes sounds, hypersonic sounds that uh, only bats can hear. And if a bat is patrolling over a patch of, of uh, dog bait like this at night, and the, one of these moths hears the bat echolocating, it will respond with a signal of its own, signaling to the bat, you don't want to eat me, I'm toxic. Uh, it can even tell the difference, the moth can, between the bat's hovering uh, echolocation, when it's sort of generally sending out a, a echolocation signal, you get sort of lay of the land, at which point it sends out its sort of generic signal, I'm no good to eat. If the bat dives toward the moth, despite the signal, the moth will emit a different signal, even more urgent, saying, you definitely don't want to eat me. <laughs> and then the bat, if it picks up the signal, will veer off at the last second and not uh, eat it. All this research was done by in one lab, I can't remember where, but something like five years ago, 2016, I think is when it was published. Uh, so it's quite ingenious. Uh, um, Prue asked me if there are any mimics, any uh, moths that, uh, that uh, aren't toxic, uh, like the Viceroy does with the monarch pattern, and uh, uh, mimics the, uh, uh, the the delicate cycnia moth, but uh, but I I I don't know. That'd be interesting to find out. So uh, a couple other things that the meadow supports: uh, eastern cottontails. Uh, these are I hate to be very political, but these are useful because they're cute, and politicians don't want to be seen as killing little bunnies. Uh, so it uh, turns out that, you know, rabbits, of course, eat well, just about any, anything green, but what do they do in the winter? In the winter, I learned that they uh, feed heavily on the on, on uh, blackberry canes, the canes themselves, thorns and all, and the bark of sumacs. So we have abundant sumac in this meadow, and we have abundant blackberry. So this is one of our arguments uh, that the... Uh, the meadow shouldn't be mowed until as late as possible in the winter. So the eastern cocktails and the things that feed on cocktails, <laughs> like predators, uh, can all have something to, to eat. Um, so uh, speaking of the winter, another reason to postpone the mowing as long as possible, uh, foxes, is, is provide cover for uh, prey animals. 
uh, and therefore the prey animals will hang out in it and predators have access to them. So these, uh, this red fox is taken a little bit further upstream in Sligo. Red tail hawk uh, perched on the perimeter of the meadow. Field sparrow, like I said, the field sparrows don't uh, so yet nest in the meadow, uh, but they show up in large uh, flocks, like 20, 30 uh, birds at once. The uh, common ragweed in the lower right is another interesting, uh, these wonderful books by John Eastman. Yeah, this is of three volumes. This is the book of field and roadside. These said, common ragweed is bird manna, sustaining resident populations over winter and helping fuel many a fall migration. Uh, elsewhere, he says that the average single rag, uh, common ragweed plant, it's not true of giant ragweed, but the common ragweed plant produces something like 30,000 seeds. And that's just one plant. So the seeds will fall to the ground and these birds can find them despite how tiny they are. So that's sort of a, sum, uh, this is a little summary of the Sligo Creek Meadow, 97 species of native bees, 125 species of native plants, 84 species of birds. There are, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a dozen uh, power line meadows in the state of Maryland. And some of them are fairly ambitious, but they're mostly, almost entirely on federal land, like US Geologic, uh, sorry, US Fish and Wildlife Service land. That would be the Tuxet Wildlife Refuge, uh, the South River Greenway, and uh, a couple of those I'll get to. This one is in Anne Arundel County between Annapolis and Bowie. And uh, it's been studied by the, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, uh, wildlife biologists in, in concert with uh, a BG&E. And they've documented 146 species of native bees, 40 species of butterflies, 126 bird species. As far as I can tell, there's never been a plant survey done in this or, or any other a power line except our little uh, quarter mile power line. And that's from, you know, it's just, uh, almost, I guess you could say amateur naturalists like me going in there and I naturalist helping uh, quite a bit too. Uh, John Parrish uh, contributed these uh, two lists of uh, endangered. That's uh, this is the state ranking S1 uh, species and threatened species that he has found on power lines in Maryland. Uh, and these are plants that, uh, if anybody's on the call who wants to uh, uh, jump in and comment on them, uh, the Travela serpentine barrens. Uh, there's it's a, a county park and a power line goes right through it. Uh, I, I've tried to find out if there was some sort of arrangement between the county, Montgomery Parks and Pepco to control the, uh, uh, the mowing, the frequency and the timing of the mowing. But all I could come up with was a proposal to create some sort of arrangement. I couldn't find any actual arrangement having been arrived at. Uh, this is a unique habitat on, on serpentine soils, very uh, low nutrient, high magnesium, low calcium. Only certain plants can uh, tolerate it. And uh, some of those are these, uh, there's these uh, endangered uh, plants. And here are threatened plants also found on power lines, uh, purple milkweed, Leonard skullcup, halberd leaf, greenbrier. Uh, another reason to uh, value uh, power lines. Now this, the, I'm sorry, the type is very small here. The only, the point of this slide is the more significant power line habitat projects around the state. BG&E is by far the leader. Uh, Pepco has these, these few, but all told, you're, 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 you look, you add these all up, 27 miles, and, you know, at first glance, you might say 27 miles of, of meadow, uh, shrubby meadow habitat, that's pretty, that sounds pretty good. Uh, but if you look at a map of the power transmission lines in the state of Maryland, 2,000 miles, all of a sudden, 27 is less than 3%. Uh, and you think, well, we could do a whole lot better than that. So why are there only, why is only 3% of, of our transmission lines managed in this way? Well, a big reason is that on county land, unincorporated county land, and in when they cross municipalities, all of them, except maybe Howard County, have weed height ordinances 
aimed at homeowners to keep their lawns at 12 inches or less. None of them have exceptions for power lines. And to, to, in order to meet this 12 inch height limit, utilities on paper must mow several times a year. Even with our meadow, okay, uh, out of the blue, sometimes they'll mow it without any warning. So here's a typical ordinance from Calvert County verbatim, it shall be unlawful for the owner of any lot, tract, or parcel to permit any excessive growth. And they define any good ordinance will have definitions. Excessive growth is more than 12 inches in height. <laughs> and you see they, they say ex excessive growth of grasses, weeds, or underbrush. In this ordinance, they do not define grass, weeds, or underbrush. So if someone at Pepco or bg &E or, or Delmarva some of the lawyers, you know, are getting worried. You know, I don't know. We haven't mowed this thing, and they're going to come after us. Or a neighbor, one neighbor, can call and say, "Hey, there's a weed ordinance for this county. How come you've let this thing go?" And they have to mow it. So it'll be the duty of the owner to remove all excessive growth. Now, some counties, Baltimore is one has a really long list. This one is Harford County of exemptions. So they've they've amended their ordinances over time. Uh, agriculture, wildlife preserves, natural resources district, habitat protection areas, and forest retention areas. However, none of them in all 23 counties in Maryland exempts power lines. So instead of trying to go county by county, in fact, we, we made an effort to amend Prince George's County's ordinance to exempt the power lines, but for complicated reasons, it fizzled out. So why not just go statewide? Uh, you probably all uh, are familiar with that uh, HOA law from 2021, uh, which passed, signed into law. And it says that uh, an HOA cannot prohibit a homeowner from growing native plants, even if they're more than 12 inches tall, which of course most of them are. And uh, I, uh, uh, at, at one point, when, after it was passed, I was told by one person that it would apply to power lines. Uh, well, long story short, I had my delegate ask the legislative research office in Annapolis, is this true? Could it, could it apply to power lines? They said, technically, yes, the wording is vague enough that it could, but a judge would look at the testimony that went into, defend, into supporting the bill, and they would find that it's 100% devoted to HOA. So no, it wouldn't apply to uh, power lines. So we need a new law. And Lauren Tricudian, my delegate, uh, District 20, was interested. Senator Malcolm Augustine from Prince George's County, it's in his district that our power line exists and the Neighborhood Association is very supportive of it. And so is he. So the bill says, uh, this is the sort of key part of the bill, for the purpose of, pro it, it, the bill is for the purpose of prohibiting local jurisdictions from imposing certain land use restrictions on pollinator friendly vegetation management, which is defined. <laughs> Uh, of public service companies within utility designated pollinator areas. Now, this is just makes it super clear that it's entirely voluntary. We're not forcing the utilities to do anything, which you might think, well, this is kind of a weak need bill, you know, where uh, we're, uh, but it's essential to go any further that the barrier presented by the, uh, the weed ordinances be put out, take, put out of the way. So uh, as a story of, of writing legislation, <laughs> the, the, the famous you know, sausage making analogy, uh, uh, the, the uh, utilities were apparently in a panic about this and no one could figure out why because it wasn't requiring them to do anything. Uh, but they were very concerned about the definition of pollinator friendly vegetation management. Because even though it was voluntary, it enshrined in state law what pollinator friendly vegetation management was. So there was a lot of back and forth between Lorg and uh, Lorg Charcutian, my delegate, and uh, BG&E especially, because they're the big player in Maryland. And uh, so you see, originally we wanted mowing only in January, February, for the reasons I went over about having uh, overwintering habitat, and no more than once per year during those months. Well, the utilities did not like the two month window and you know, with 2000 miles to mow, you know, you can't do that in two weeks. Uh, so, and we brought in, uh, I should say, Laura, together we brought in Sandy Spencer, who is the wildlife biologist at Patuxent 
uh, Research Reserve, they have two power lines going through there, one with Pepco and one with BG&E, one in Montgomery County, one in, uh, sorry, one in Prince George's, one in Anne Arundel. And uh, she has tons of experience. They have uh, every five years, she develops a memo of understanding with each one. It's extremely detailed. So she was very, very helpful. And she felt it was fine to extend the mowing window, which the utilities called it, to November to March. You know, there's obviously there's a we fought like we fought very hard to keep October out of there because the monarchs are still flying uh, uh, north, and we didn't want to interfere with that. In Western Maryland, the weather is very different, uh, and it's it's October to April there. Uh, so, in exchange for the wider window in any one year, they now can only uh, mow it every two years. So every other year, the entire the, um, the habitat remains intact over the course of the winter. On top of that, they agreed to uh, what's called rotational mowing. Sometimes it's done linearly, sometimes it's done in blocks. And that is no more than half of any pollinator area could be mowed in any one fall or winter season. Uh, another consideration, which we uh, haven't, which has come up through the hearings and listening to, to uh, legislators ask questions, they think most, some of them think their constituents will not want this at all, and they're all afraid of bees, snakes, and vermin of all kinds creeping into their yards. <laughs> okay, so, you know, we emphasize it's strictly voluntary uh, and so forth, but another, a good strategy that um, that's recommended uh, in a lot of different areas is to get the community involved and let them decide what kind of meadow they want and to stress that there are many different approaches even just in Maryland. So here for the really cautious you know uh, you know keep nature at a distance kind of crowd uh, it's nice to have it but you know at arm's length here is this is what uh, uh, bg and &E did in, in Columbia paved walking trails, a nice bridge. They even have a signage that explains what's going on and why it's done this way. It connects neighborhoods, uh, it, kids use it to get to school and it's incredibly popular. Uh, another thing that's of great concern is the perimeters. Some people really don't want the meadow coming right up to the property line. And so this is a little, if you're familiar with cues to caring, it's a, a strategy to keep, if you wanna grow a native uh, a garden, if you want your yard to be native, it's always, it's a good idea to have, use techniques that show that what you're doing is deliberate and not a sign of neglect. A lot of people will interpret a native uh, yard as, as being neglected. But if you, if you mow a little border, if you put up a little fence, you put up some signs, some sculpture, a little path through it, something like that, it tells people, oh, this is on purpose. And it's, much, it's been found through you know, focus groups and studies that this is much more acceptable. So this is the, also the case with power lines. Uh, this is Montgomery Village in, in uh, Montgomery County. Uh, they uh, arrived at the Montgomery Village Corporation. Their lawyers had to create a a very formal document before Pepco would proceed because of the weed ordinance, but they did, and it's very nice. Um, you could choose this. This is what we have in Sligo. Uh, I just call it a rustic dirt access trail. Uh, maybe all of um, power lines have some sort of access road that's used every now and then. And uh, right now, the uh, Prince George's Parks is mowing has started mowing ours frequently uh, during the summer and so that keeps it very nice. Uh, families like it, dog walkers like it. Uh, and, uh, but that's all, the perimeters aren't mowed. There's no paving of any kind. And you all might be familiar with this. I don't know if this is a valid category, but it, this is what it looks like at uh, Patuxent. It's a gravel road. It's used much more often than most uh, dirt access roads and power lines. And uh, uh, this is, uh, the, the, the fabulously successful meadow, uh, and those are nodding ladies' tresses right next to the uh, gravel road. Uh, I took that picture some a couple of years ago. So the uh, the uh, the pit, it's time for the pitch, and that is to uh, 
help us get this bill out of the committees. Uh, there are two committees. This is, this is the before and after picture in Sligo. Um, that's the bill name. The House, relevant House committee is called Economic Matters because they deal with utilities. They have 24 members. They're from all over the state. And in the link, you'll be able to see which counties they're in. And of course, uh, districts are much smaller than counties. The Senate is much smaller. That's a brand new committee that uh, was formed after uh, Governor Moore came in and they worked out an arrangement to rejigger things. It has only 11 members. The web, it's quite easy to navigate, mgaleg.maryland.gov. Um, now there's the name of the bill. Um, let's see, uh, I didn't, I, well, we'll figure out how to get that to you, but H, H, HB or SB 62, all the legislators will know exactly what you're talking about. So if you go onto that website, you, can, you have a choice immediately of, oh, okay, I want committees. There it is, second from the left. And then you choose Senate or House. I chose Senate for the, uh, so House for this one. And there's the entire membership of the Economic Matters Committee. The sponsor of the bill, uh, Lori Charkudian, is, uh, oh, there she is, uh, top row, second from the right. And she's worked incredibly hard on this bill. She talked to Xerxes Society on the phone. She talked to National Wildlife Federation. They talked to, uh, well, Sandy Spencer from Patuxent. So you, um, and they list the counties that they represent. So you can, okay, uh, if you're in Calvert County, maybe there's only one in Calvert and that'll make your job ease pretty easy. So then you open up one delegates, uh, you click on one delegate and uh, this is the chair of the committee and you've got his phone number. These are not fax phone, uh, two phone numbers, an email address. And then on the far right is a map of the district. You click on that, you can zoom in and see, okay, am, am I in that district or not? And if not, uh, then move over to the Senate side, see if, if maybe your Senator is on that committee. So to figure out, to get a general idea, uh, you, this, this you get to by clicking on find my legislator. <laughs> That's also uh, very close to the home page. I can't remember exactly, but it's easy to find. These are the districts and it's, you know, you can zoom way in and, and figure out exactly. Baltimore City seems to have the most complicated uh, uh, districts uh, that have bear a lot of study. So, so uh, if what well, the, the key is uh, that the uh, legislators on these committees only listen to people from their district, I'm sorry to say. So, if you are in the in one of those districts, you know you can make an impact. And they say, you know, three or four phone calls makes a huge difference. Um, or if you know somebody who might live in one of those districts, or you might have a cousin or something who lives in one of those districts and is more or less on board, um, that's the way to do it. Uh, there, one of the reasons uh, my delegate Lord uh, says that because there's two thousand five hundred bills every session. One of the big challenges is that getting is getting them what they say listed, uh, and they and they will vote on a list of maybe five bills at once or ten bills at once. But getting your bill onto one of those lists uh, is is the goal. Uh, the, the what you don't want is to have the bill put in a drawer. That's the phrase they used, which means no one will discuss it until next year. So I want to. Uh, Credit Sierra Club Maryland chapter, uh, which I, I, I joined as part of the uh, uh, Natural Places Committee. They really know how, how Annapolis works. You all at the Maryland Native Plant Society wrote, uh, 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 gave um, oral testimony, Judy Fulton, to the House and Senate committees, Friends of Sligo Creek, of course, the Carroll Highland Neighborhood, Neighborhood Association uh, has really uh, changed the uh, uh, whole equation from a purely natural history emphasis like mine to a community emphasis because they love the meadow and uh, they'll, they, a big cleanup is coming up in, in a few weeks. Um, um, Asha should credit the uh, uh, Maryland Ornithological Society, also to, uh, provide a written testimony and Mid-Atlantic Audubon 
provided uh, written and spoken testimony. Um, for um, Nature Forward, formerly an uh, Audubon Natural Society, provided very good written testimony. Um, the author of the Xerxes Society um, uh, Guide to Mid-Atlantic Meadows uh, now works for them. Uh, even though their guide is, is, is a seriously, uh, what they call active uh, restoration manual, which is uh, a long-term expensive labor intensive uh, effort. And this is totally passive restoration. She, she wrote a fantastic uh, support letter uh, for, this, uh, for this bill. So great, grateful to them and to everybody who contributed photographs uh, from, the, uh, from the meadow. That was really interesting. So let's, I'll, I'll go through the questions in the chat. Someone asked, um, uh, did PEPCO seed anything there? Well, you know, the, the power line was carved out of there back in the thirties, I think we've been looking some, one of the neighbors has been looking at uh, historic aerial photos. And I think there was a, it was already there in the thirties. I, I can't be sure. What I can say is that uh, when they replaced the towers, they took down these old, more like Eiffel Tower looking things and put in these more like rod looking. Uh, they, we had a lot of back and forth with them about what they were gonna, they had to seed it because of erosion issues, but what were they gonna seed it with? Did we have some input into that? And, uh, but anyway, whenever they replace something, they definitely uh, seed it. Interesting. Um Jennifer Souls comments that um, the Clifton Institute has done some similar interesting work in often in power lines, and and she put a link there for. Yeah, I uh, went on an outing that uh, that they led. Uh, it was a, a, a one of these. Uh, it was not a transmission. I've learned there's transmission lines and there are distribution lines. The transmission lines are the big high towers, very long cables uh, suspended high high overhead. And then the distribution lines, which are usually on the wooden uh, telephone poles. So I'm, the, the outing we had at Clifton uh, was, I think, on a distribution line. But uh, it was uh, quite interesting. They, 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 the property is owned by the Girl Scouts uh, of America, and they're trying to work out some arrangement with them to, uh, to preserve it. They have a, a problem there that um, uh, the people are promoting uh, roadside vegetation management to, to support pollinators have that the neighbors will come in and mow stuff that's not their property so somebody in the clifton power line stretch goes in and mows it when no one's looking at the worst possible time so uh, it's very frustrating uh, for them but i do i am following what they're doing and uh, it's really useful Excellent. lucia comments and asks a question at the end i live in an area where the woods behind my house is owned by the power company they only mow pathways for their trucks. The rest is lush brush fields. In the spring and summer, I've spotted over 20 plus species of migrating birds nesting back there. I pray they never decide to mow. How can I stop it if they decide to do so? Wow. Um, okay, well, that brings in the question of like, what's the next step? Like, okay, we're removing this barrier. They're still not required to do anything. Well, um, a lawyer friend of mine uh, are, uh, suggested uh, that we, uh, the Public Service Commission, and I've looked into the Public Service Commission, they regulate the utilities. Mm -hmm. They have a mission statement or a statement, a list of values, uh, like six or, or seven, and three of them are environmental. Mm -hmm. uh, and on top of that, they, re at least for a five year stretch, they required all six major utilities to report on their vegetation management. And one of the things they wanted to know is how much are you spending per mile per year of transmission lines on vegetation management? And each year, Pepco came out spending way more than anybody else. And each year, the report chastises Pepco and says they promised to do better. Well, the, the lesson I took from this is that the Public Service Commission cares a great deal about mowing. And... And now uh, Governor Moore has, has appointed three new members of Public Service Commission. And Josh Tolkien was quoted in the Post as saying, these three appointments do more, will do more to advance environmental causes in Maryland than, than a dozen new laws, which I confess to not fully comprehending or appreciate. Mm -hmm. But if this bill passes, I, I think we will definitely 
be approaching the Public Service Commission? In other words, can we say, all right, you're now doing, let's say 5%, if we missed some, you're doing 5%. Can we require the utilities to devote 20% of these 2,000 miles to, uh, to uh, uh, pollinator-friendly habitat? Uh, so that's the next step. So that, that's where our member who's asked that question, the question of uh, what they're required or not required to do. Um, but you know, they respond to public, to public opinion. They definitely respond to politicians. If you set up a meeting in that, in that property and you ask Pepco vegetation manager to come and you say, my state delegate is gonna be there, they will definitely show up. In fact, they may show up in force. <laughs> so there is uh, somebody with Maryland Native Plant Society, and I apologize for getting their name, discovered a wetland with some important plants in it uh, near uh, Adelphi, Maryland. And she kept trying to meet with Pepco there and they kept not showing up and postponing and dragging their feet. She then invited people from the PG uh, County Council there, said, okay, we're having a meeting with them. I hope you could make it. They showed up with like 10 people from Pepco. <laughs> so I would recommend in the case of this property, if you can get a politician interested, that's your ticket. Yeah, good to know about the Public Service Commission too. I didn't know that layer. So that's something to keep in our back pockets. Definitely, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, Leonard commented, which I think you managed to say just as he was typing it, I believe the Viceroy butterfly survives by mimicking the monarch, so. Yeah, um, yeah, so that was Prue's question. Is there a moth that, that avoids predation by mimicking uh, the dogbane tiger moth without bothering to do all the work <laughs> of digesting the sap? <laughs> So I think that's called, uh, that's either Batesian mimicry or Malarian mimicry. I, I always get those two mixed up. I didn't know there were two kinds. But, um, Mark um, asks, what height do they mow in late winter? Well, I have looked into this a little bit. Some of you are members of Wild Ones. Uh, Wild Ones suggests uh, mowing no lower than 24 inches, or I think 18 to 24. Uh, the reason, being that a lot of insects uh, lay their eggs in the stems of, uh, of plants with hollow pits or soft pits, and they tend to lay them low down in the plant. Uh, uh, sumacs and blackberries are supposed to both be good for that. And I think also herbaceous uh, plants with, if they have a sturdy uh, uh, stem. Uh, um, Sam Drogi at, uh, at Patuxent, he said, I think he told me eight inches. He thinks eight inches is sufficient um, to to preserve most of the bees. But the last time I asked about, we we actually were hoping to put a mowing height into the bill as part of the definition of pollinator friendly vegetation management. But I think I was told that you know uh, heavy duty bush hogs don't exist that will mow uh, uh, so high. When I had this problem with the Army National Guard's natural resource manager. We found that was the problem. Where can you buy lawnmowers that work at a height of 18 inches? And we finally found it. Ah, and okay. Then we, then we had them buy that, but it was a challenge to find it. But they are out there. There is a way to buy them. That is That will come into our pitch to the Public Service Commission, I think. Adeline asks, if I want to bird there, where would I park? And can I enter, or do I observe only from the periphery? I notice on eBird, the meadow is labeled restricted access. Yeah, so John Stith, our birder in the neighborhood, felt he had to put restricted access, uh, even though there's no sign that says no access. Uh, now, this meadow is contiguous with uh, property managed by Prince George's Parks. That's the Hiker Biker Trail that goes along Sligo Creek at the very bottom of the hill. Uh, so there's no way Pepco can keep people out. And they've never tried to keep people out. Um, so you can park on a 16th place or on Drexel, uh, 16th place dead ends at the, uh, at the uh, power line. And I've never had any trouble uh, uh, parking. Um, and if you wanna email me, I can put you in touch with anybody who wants to, you can email naturalhistory at fosc.org, F-O-S-C, that's Friends of Sligo Creek, naturalhistory at fosc.org. Uh, we'll get you onto John's uh, list uh, for announcing outings. 
we have an outing every month, uh, sometimes early in the morning for birds, sometimes in the late in the day for people who aren't morning people. <laughs> uh, I'll just jump into one because I you. saw it come up a bunch of times is generally the question was dealing with invasives. What to expect? How did you handle that? You know, I'm kind of curious. It looks like you started with very tightly mowed area, which probably in some ways reduced your invasive load. But, you know, if you could expand on that a little bit and what the long term yeah. plan and then in similar vein, uh, mowing under power lines, there's often the discussion that it has to be done to deal with the with the tree growth. So, yeah, it, kind of address that. But yeah, oh. well, the uh, the utilities general approach is. They have uh, their the perp the reason they mow uh, the main reason for in terms of power production the safe and reliable delivery of electrical energy uh, to customers is to get rid of woodies uh, uh, trees that are uh, cropping up their their mowers can mow anything up to two inches in diameter uh, which is pretty hefty uh, I found that if they mow it every other year the the natives. And, and the invasives sort of were in a, a standoff. The natives could compete as long as, uh, successfully, as long as the invasives like the porcelain berry or uh, especially the porcelain berry uh, 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 was cut back every year. Uh, it's only when it's never cut back that, you know, because the vines persist year after year, they cover more and they cover more and they cover more and they're more and more. And it's, it's just a, a, a one-way ticket to, being completely smothered over. But when they're when they're mowed down and, and each spring, the blackberries and the uh, or the sumacs and the and the porcelainberry both start at zero, with kind of a zero. The blackberries and sumacs do pretty well. Uh, or the greenbrier. We have lots of greenbrier, both kinds. Um, the biggest uh, threat is actually from Bradford pears, um, uh, which started off in neat rows directly beneath the power lines <laughs> from <laughs> seeds deposited by all the birds hanging out on the power line. But they, I think they've spread <laughs> colonially and a super dense, nothing can grow between them. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, the bees love the pollen and the nectar, but nothing else can grow in there. Uh, so they have to be, they have to be incredibly Pepco twice in 2016 and 2021, the, this is the this is the environmental stewardship division. I think paid for this to have a crew go the entire quarter mile length of the meadow and hand cut all the uh, all the uh, Bradford or Chinese pear, which meant that nothing else had to be cut. The, you know, all the uh, sumacs and and uh, uh, and, the, and the blackberries all survived, which is which is fantastic. I don't think they were painting the stumps with you know, glyphosate and uh, triplicor, but they talked about doing it. So this was quite heroic. I mean, but to show you how bad the communication is within Pepco, the last in 2021, when they spent a whole day with a crew of 10 guys hand cutting all these, and there were thousands of, of, of Bradford pears hand cutting them. And then we've got, oh, it's all under control. Things are looking really well. A week later, uh, they bush hogged the whole thing. So <laughs> it was a complete waste of time and energy, but it's like the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is. It's really an ultimate example of that. So I might say I've done this at a lot of parks and it turns out it's very easy when the invasive like Japanese barberry or bush honeysuckle first comes in, get it right away. And you just cut it at root level and there's a small area there and you apply 15% glyphosate to that little cup that forms there and it's permanent. Yeah. Yeah, they think, uh, now, um, if somebody wants to, I have the, the memo of an understanding between Patuxent Research Reserve and bg and &E and Pepco, I think it's the bg and &E agreement, where they're very specific about what, how bg and &E should do it. It's, it's the only, the herbicide spray, uh, application is backpack only and it's only for solid uh, uh extensive infestations um otherwise it's it's mowing so the bill for this thing actually says uh you know it, it has uh, it says you know mechanical uh cutting uh cutting pulling blah, 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 blah. then number two says you know if method one 
uh, either uh, fails or has been scientifically demonstrated to be uh, ineffective in managing certain invasive situations, then uh, chemicals can be used in the uh, of the least toxic variety in the smallest possible zone uh, uh, to reduce the harm to native species uh, wildlife. And yeah, yeah, you never massively spray. You just cut at the ground level and apply a small amount yeah. at that level. Yeah, and, and the volunteers yeah, so can pull out English ivy vines, but if they're too thick, like two inches, then you do the same thing. You cut it at a ground level. And yeah, I think we 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 are. Uh, there's no weed warrior option with Pepco. I don't think we. There would be a there'd be a liability issue if we sent volunteers in to do anything unless they wanted to. You know, uh, uh, there is a. Originally, we were hoping to model the agreement that um, Pepco made with Montgomery Parks and the uh, off-road uh, bicycling organization for a, uh, a bike trail, a dirt bike trail through the Pepco power line from Germantown to Bethesda. And it was a three-way agreement uh, and a license was, was issued, which meant that Pepco wouldn't sue them for uh, working on the trail and, and, and using it, human use. But the, the agreement for, for Exelon to merge with Pepco was contingent upon them agreeing to do this as a, to increase uh, human access to these power lines. This was their pilot project. And they seem to have agreed in the writing that they, that, that they would explore other ones in both counties. So we were hoping to model something off of that agreement and have Anacostia Watershed Society be the nonprofit, PG Parks be the government and Pepco doing their thing and granting a license so that we could uh, legally uh, use the meadow and maybe do uh, basis management without getting into trouble. But like I said, that fizzled out. And uh, that's why I read this uh, state level. So I think that, yeah, the issue of, so so yeah, the invasives, like I said, mowing every, every year, or every two years seems to create a level playing field. That's the way I interpret it. It doesn't get rid of them. But it means they have to start over every 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 spring, and and that's not easy for them. I mean, the blackberry and the and the uh, and the green buyer, they're they're very tough. <laughs> they can hold their own uh, against the the invasives if you do the mowing, you know, once every couple of years. Interesting. A couple of questions on when this bill comes up and how long it's open for comments. Well, uh, the reason I joined the Sierra Club. Uh, natural places committees because they know how Annapolis works. Uh, even uh, uh, it's, it's a lot of a lot of it is not clear. Uh, in fact, I've been trying to find out when is the committee going to vote on this bill. After which, there's no point in lobbying the committee. And even Lord Charcutian has no idea. She's on the committee, <laughs> she, and she's been there for a long time. I I don't know. I I just don't know how. The timing of these things is ever predictable. Like for the hearings, they told us we will probably get at most a one-week notice of when the, the date of the hearing, date and time of the hearing, and uh, then you have to make sure you sign up to testify in this uh, window, uh, this five-hour window, two days before for the House, one day before for the Senate, same window for submitting uh, written testimony. So it's. Uh, Okay. So yeah. I, I, unfortunately, I don't know when the vote is, and and Lord's staff can't tell me. So uh, I guess what we'd say is uh, I can work with with uh, Prue and Lauren that when I hear that a vote has taken place, I we can notify the Mayo Native Plant Society membership that uh, now, in fact, it's time to 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 talk to your delegate, no matter where you live, because it's going to the full chamber, oh, the full yeah, house, and the good. full center. But the key is getting it out of these committees is, is the, the key struggle. I'm going to comment briefly as I'm, I'm just starting to uh, learn how to do some of this uh, advocacy work or whatever, you know, testifying and so forth. You have to make, if you make an account with the assembly, you can enter, I guess, bills that you're interested in tracking and it'll send you updates or something like that. I'm not, I haven't actually done it yet. I don't know how it works exactly. But I am kind of curious, like, so you're trying to track this by talking directly to a committee member. That's what you're doing to figure out 
Is yes, that but I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up because if you go to um, uh, MGA Leg, that's Maryland General Assembly legislation. M MGA Leg, dot, etc. Uh, and the upper right, of way far upper right extreme corner, you'll see this icon. It says My MGA. It's like where a lot of websites put their YouTube icon. You click on My MGA, and that gets you started. You can set up an account, and uh, then you can uh, uh, get notified when bills are moving at each step. You can sign up for different bills. Um, but you can track, I think you can track a bill without having an MGA account. I'm not sure, but it's easy. You just give them, you know, it's your email address and password. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, you're, you, you're, there are ways you can, it's not that hard to track uh, these bills. So on that home page that I showed, uh, in addition to committees, there's a tab that says, um, uh, that says uh, legislation. So uh, you click on legislation and then they list them by, well, you have to choose House or Senate and then it's in numerical order. So it's not that hard to find, especially since it's 62, it's a very low number. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Okay. Well, first showed my MGA. Yeah, up here right. in the yeah. right corner. Yeah, go to legislation. Here. And I'll go to House. Now scroll, I think you have to go to page two, scroll down to the bottom at, in order to be able to go up to this page two. Okay. I think it's on page two. Yeah, it should be very close. So there's 62 and then click on that. Okay, so it's still in the committee. That's good. <laughs> we can still affect the outcome. Um, right. Now, if you also go see where it's still blue, HB0062, there you can read the bill itself. Um, and then you can complain to me about things you don't like about it. <laughs> it's the best we could do. Uh, but it was pretty, I mean, uh, uh, Judy Foster, I think is on this call, she helped a great deal with, you, ha you have to define everything and defining what a native plan is, mm -hmm. defining what a non-native invasive plan is. Mostly it's referral to lists that are curated by reliable people. Uh, so that, that was Judy Fulton. Fulton, I'm sorry. Yeah. Judy Fulton. Yeah. She, all right. I'll stop sharing, but that's the idea. People can explore and yeah, it's involved. it's it's pretty user user friendly. Uh, I'm surprised. Someone asks about um, he lives in Southern Prince George's and works with the Black Swamp Creek Land Trust, hmm. um, named after the watershed they're living in, and they're endeavoring. To um, to protect it. And he believes that SME Co power line that stretches through the watershed. How do you recommend connecting about this power, power line in Southern Prince George's County? And, and he's, anyone interested in helping, he asks to look at the Black Swamp Creek Land Trust.org. And what's the, what's his, which utility, which utility is it? SME Co power line. Southern Maryland. Energy. Um, energy co op. Yeah, there are. Yeah, I, I know there are a, a f two or three cooperatives. Uh, uh, Smeco is pretty good. They have even some Sierra Club staff members. Oh, yeah. Now, um, now, what county does SME, what county is Black Swamp in? Prince George's. Well, oh, Southern Prince George's. Uh, Mark, does SME serve, serve your area? Uh -huh. SMACO? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe the two of you can be in, in touch with each other. Yeah. So it was Joanne uh, Flynn asked that question. Yeah. I know a couple people asked about other states and whether any other states are doing this work. Yeah. Uh, we learned uh, early on through Lorg's uh, team's research uh, with, the, with the Legislative Research Office that there is no other state in the country that has passed laws, anything anything related to vegetation management and habitat. In fact, they, they legislators seem to have taken very little interest in power line vegetation at all. So the, uh, the all the action so far has been at the municipal city and you know small town level. 
if, if you want to see some really interesting and that for for wild ones um uh which is interested in the county montgomery county ordinance the national wildlife federation in uh fall of 2021 published a i think it's called and it's online guide to passing wildlife friendly property maintenance ordinances that's the name of the document and we met with the author and uh, and they they have model bills which they picked from green bay uh minneapolis and uh, austin texas bills that they think you know do a really good job and then they also have language that they recommend definitional language and everything else uh, so that's a pretty that was an inspiring fact when we thought we were going to be amending the pg county <laughs> ordinance but this statewide method is 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 much simpler and the utilities are going to much more likely get behind it because they they love a level playing field they, they care a great deal they don't you know the patchwork that they hate they hate patchwork laws um i think like the um like the hoa law this will be if it passes <laughs> uh first in the nation i i have asked you know they the uh, a sierra club and the uh, they have a paid lobbyist this year is that a, is that appealing to legislators to be first in the nation or not and they all said it depends on the legislature <laughs> some like to forge ahead and, and some are very cautious and they say well what about precedent in other states well that depends on the legislator if for some legislators if it's been done in oklahoma and kansas oh well then they're totally on board if it's been done in california and new york oh no, no we don't trust California or New York. So, you know, there's no blanket rule you can say about either precedent or being first in the nation. In fact, when we were trying to get Prince George's County to amend theirs, we thought that they would like the fact that Montgomery County hadn't amended its weed ordinance and they could beat Montgomery County to the punch and stick it to Montgomery County, which I think they like to do whenever possible. No, they didn't like that because they they said, well, well, we'd much rather have Montgomery County go first because they're all lawyered up. And if it can have pass muster in lawyered up Montgomery County, then we know we're on safe ground. They didn't want to risk it. So there you go. There's comments about someone here lives in Massachusetts where power line quarters are managed by periodic shrub tree management about every five to 10 years. And oh. otherwise the herbaceous plants are left alone. Go Massachusetts. Oh, Mark, you have a question. Well, I wanted to, um bring up a topic that the Natural Places Committee ha had with Michael is this, once you win your battle, and we've won the battle on power lines, then we want to follow up with other native plant metal habitats besides power lines. And I'd like to give one perfect example, you may want to take a note of this, Michael, a couple of years from now, Port Tobacco River Conservancy, the Southern Maryland Audubon Society and Charles County Government have got the Port Tobacco River Park a 50 acre native plant meadow that's perfect. And I was the one that played the role. It turned out only 10% of the not of the uh, plants were non-native invasive and they could me mechanically remove almost all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, like the National Wildlife Federation says for backyard wildlife habitats, just use cut stump on trees and shrubs. Um, and, and the advantage of glyphosate, it's the best herbicide it, because it only kills the target plant. It's the worst if you touch other plants besides the target plant. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll look into Massachusetts. Yeah, for sure. And and uh, as long as we're talking about uh, Sierra Club, there's another pollinator related, related bill. Uh, I just wrote testimony. We learned about it recently. It is involves a state highway administration and the mowing of roadsides, which have proven to be have potential as pollinator habitat if you don't mow it, you know, every other week. Um, so there's a, a, they were, the SHA was required to develop a plan back in 2016, the state of Maryland passed the Pollinator Protection Plan Act, which required DNR, MO, Maryland, Department of the Environment and State Highway to develop plans to increase their pollinator habitat and, and State Highway really dropped the ball in there. The only plan they came up with had to do with uh, rest stops, welcome centers, and office buildings. Not a not one inch of a roadway. So this new bill is devoted entirely to telling them they have to develop a plan for roadways. And uh, uh, but they did. They spent some money. They sponsored a three-year study in Frederick and Carroll County on state roads uh, with an entomologist from the University of Maryland. 
uh, and uh, demonstrated very nicely, you know, that uh, that uh, doing mowing only in the, in the late fall and selective herbicide treatment is it, it, uh, uh, a tremendous number of, of native plants and uh, and native bees are supported compared to you know mowing it uh, constantly. So so that's that's another one that's you know in the pipeline. We'll see what happens. Another comment that in Pennsylvania they mow every five years. So wow, <laughs> that's interesting. Well, the Maryland law says no, no more than every other year. They can go every five, and in Sligo they've definitely gone every five. Sometimes they just seem to have completely forgotten, which is fine. But eventually they have to go in there because, like I said, the invasives will take over. And then I did see a comment uh, or a question really asking how the kestrels were using the, I call it trypsicum. I don't know, uh, the tri trypsicum. Oh. Do you know, did they actually eat that or is it the- You, mean the, uh, you mean the grasshoppers? Oh, grasshoppers, okay. I think someone asked of kestrels, yeah. maybe they were confused. Let's see, what did this say? Yeah, the, the how did the kestrels use it? Okay. Right, the kestrels, uh, sorry, the grasshoppers eat the, eat the grasses and the kestrels eat the grasshoppers. Uh, I mean, we have a very small stand of the of the uh, gamma grass. You know, it's uh, it's just, uh, mostly I showed it to uh, to demonstrate the diversity of grasses that we have, but they're probably feeding heavily on uh, broom sedge, uh, uh, blue stem. Uh, there are a number of naturalized, especially the early, uh, the cool season grasses are almost entirely European, uh, vel uh, velvet grass, uh, Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, uh, orchard grass, but you get after, once from July onward, it's uh, all native grasses. And I'm going to guess that the um, the uh, kestrels might eat rodents too. I think, rodents. They, I think we've even seen them. Uh, we have a whole bunch of trees that were uh, snagged by Pepco. They left, instead of cutting them down at the root, they, they agreed to snag them. And the kestrel likes to perch up on top of one of the big snags and and dissect its prey up there. <laughs> okay. Well, so, the, yeah. the grasses and especially something like trypsicum with it has fairly large seeds is probably a magnet for rodents, right? Good point, it, it's yeah. It's very closely related to corn, so you can imagine. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah they do have huge seeds, yeah. I don't know about that. Huh. And, I and, think and since we're, we, were, we mentioned mowing, uh, and I, this might be of interest to, to people that, uh, but you know, mowing is essentially a uh, human substitute for grazing. Um, ecologically, that's a good way to look at it. And there's plenty of people who would argue that there used to be large bison herds uh, in this part of North America back, uh, you know, 10,000 years ago. Uh, and you know, there's an ecologist on the Eastern shore who's managing many thousands of acres of grassland. Uh, uh, I can't remember his name, uh, uh, Gill. Uh, but uh, he, he's managing it under all kinds of different regimes, including a whole a few hundred acres that's uh, grazed entirely by uh, by bison. And the uh, in in uh, Ohio, uh, there's a a, a, a a tall grass prairie restoration project outside of Toledo. I have to drive past, go go there last May, and they're using uh, dairy cattle uh, as the grazers, and they have signage up explaining what they're doing, like. Why are there cows in the prairie? And they explain that they're filling in for where the bison used to be. Yeah, unfortunately, the cows graze too low. The height uh, bison graze that supports any ingress switch grass boost them. Um, so you, we do need to switch to bison. And a lot of the Sierra Club convinced a lot of cattle ranchers to switch to bison in the Midwest. We had a big success at that. Cool. So, so now the prairie states. When I was natural resource manager, I'm a national guard managing it. It turned out the natural way you do it is one third of the land is mowed by bison, one third by fire, and one third is left alone. And it goes in a mosaic pattern. It rotates around. Hmm. That sounds ideal. Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, I, I would love to have a day when there are animals out there. <laughs> mowing it for us and we can teach kids about uh, about large large mammals 
at the same time as we're doing. Maybe we can find a use for, you know, the deer don't go out there that much. Uh, I was gonna say, you could have our deer. <laughs> yeah, they, they're, they're in the neighborhood, all right, but they, and they, you can see where they uh, uh, sleep and stuff. But There's yeah. two bison farms in Maryland. They sell their food to the Whole Foods and they've been certified by Chesapeake Bay organizations. They don't have too many bison, just the right number. And it does result in a native plant ecosystem, metal, native plant metal ecosystem. Hmm. So that's where I buy my bison. Hmm. Well, should we wrap up there, Lauren? Is that a good time? Let I think so. It's getting late. It was a really brilliant talk. Lots of great discussion. Hey, I want to just throw one more thing out. Uh, first of all, I'm really grateful, not just for this opportunity, but for everything all the inspiration Maryland Native Plant Society has given me over the last 15 years, going to, you know, the monthly talks and on outings and the conferences and everything, you know, having like-minded people around you to make, to uh, help you believe that what you're doing is, 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 is important and, 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 and uh, legitimate. Uh, even if people who find you out on your knees with a magnifying glass, <laughs> trying to want to think well, you're very strange. Uh, and uh, I want to call out specifically uh, Wes, uh, West Knapp, because when we had our three-way uh, uh, West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland meeting out in West Virginia, somewhere near Harpers Ferry, uh, somebody asked him in his talk, uh, he says, well, what can, what can the average person do? And, and he said, find a place and love it to death. <laughs> he didn't mean that exactly, of course. But when he said that, I thought, okay, so I, don't, you know, I spent so much time in this meadow. And now I'm here, the, what, he was the, the senior botanist for the state of Maryland is saying to do exactly that. And uh, um, like, uh, I don't know who saved Chapman Chapman Woods, Chapman Forest, but that was, as I understand it, you know, one one person who just wouldn't give up for many years and now it's a state park. So thank you, Maryland Native Plants Society. <laughs> well, thank you both for your work and for a really fun and in inspiring talk. And um, I will. I will. Uh, I would like to point out that I have just recently started calling my legislatures. I was telling Michael about this earlier, and it's not that frightening. They expect us to call them, and if you're really frightened, what I did, my gateway call was to call after hours and leave a message on the answering machine. And I realized, okay, I can. That was a tip from someone in Sierra Club, and uh, so yeah, it's it's not it's not a difficult thing to do. You don't have to say much. They're not going to quiz you which is my worry. <laughs> so yeah, encourage everybody to do that.